How are we doing today? I trust we all had a uh, happy Thanksgiving and hopefully didn't fill our stomachs too much. And uh, let's not forget that we have our business meeting next Sunday, followed by potluck. And uh, for the, we also have the tentative nominations for 2024 posted on back table. If anyone has any questions, please see an elder. And uh, we have our living greetings from Joe Knapp and Dan Annis. And if we could also keep prayer for Gene Teeter and Cindy Show. And let's go ahead and open up with hymn 587, He Keeps Me Singing. We'll sing all verses. May you please rise. <clears throat> steadfast healing, get better, and, and to have you lay your healing hands upon them. Father, we pray for Brother, Brother Dennis and the worship team. Pray that you are able to allow Brother Dennis to speak what is on his mind and his heart. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
for him for the second hymn 618 uh, I will sing the wondrous story we will sing all verses you may rise if you like dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and of the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he said, consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire 
as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising the Lord, set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were rooted. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes, and the enemies were defeated. At some military camps across Europe during World War II, an unusual type of supply was airdropped for sick, homesick soldiers. They dropped in upright pianos. They were specially made to contain only 10% of the normal amount of metal and they received special water-resistant glue and anti-insect treatments. The pianos are rugged and simple, but they provided hours of spirit-lifting entertainment for soldiers who gathered around them to sing familiar songs of home. Singing, especially songs of praise, is one way that believers in Jesus can find peace in the battle also. King Jehoshaphat found this to be true when he, was fate, when he faced vast invading armies. Terrified, the king called all the people together for prayer and fasting. In response, God told him to lead out soldiers to meet the enemy, promising that they'd not have to fight the battle. Jehovah just, just so, yeah, believed God and acted in faith. He appointed singers to go ahead of the soldiers and sing praise to God for the victory they believed they would see. And as their music began, he miraculously defeated their enemies and saved his people. Victory doesn't always come when or how we want it to, but we can always proclaim Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death that's already been won for each one of us. We can choose to rest in a spirit of worship, even in the middle of a war zone. Thank you, Brother Richard. And now for some worship songs. Good morning. I hate to call this a war zone, but I watched the six o'clock news last night, and yeah, it is. Um, singing is great. Um, I know that it has given me many, many times of just uh, cooling down if things were going bad. I could sit down and, and uh, play a song, sing a song, and it's miraculous that uh, how, how soothing it can be. As we do watch the news, we know that things are falling apart pretty rapidly here, and so we should be singing even more. Uh, so let's rise and sing. We'll sing for joy. You can't just sing with, uh, you know, glum faces. You got to smile and sing with enthusiasm and sing for joy. Yeah. 
bills come at the wrong time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sing for joy. Here I am to worship. That's what we're here for this morning. Sing praises to the Lord and worship His holy name. sleep while I'm talking this morning, all right? It's good to have you all here. Uh, I thought it would be uh, nice to go through the story of Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. Uh, I think it's the greatest story in the New Testament, other than, of course, the, the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross and his resurrection. And, uh, and so I think what I'd like to do this morning, this will be an interactive study, Okay, so I'll be asking for your help to read and, of course, comment on anything that uh, we have here. I have a lot of questions on the sheets that are being handed out uh, for you to peruse. So hopefully when we do this, right, uh, the story of La Raising of Lazarus is, is familiar to us, but 
do we understand all the spiritual implications of the raising of Lazarus? Mm. Give me a minute to hand these out. If you have your Bibles with you, you're going to want to turn to the 11th chapter of John, John's Gospel. Uh, and so uh, I'll read the comments that are on here. Uh, this is a study we did uh, in at least 10 or 12 years since we did this study. And I thought it would be a good time to remind us again uh, of its implications and, uh, and its benefits to you and I. So the miracle of the raising of Lazarus is by far the crown and jewel of all the miracles that God did through the Lord Jesus during his three and a half year ministry on earth. In addition to the power of the miracle itself, there are supreme theological and doctrinal lessons that we can learn from the narration itself, particularly in the dialogues between Jesus and Martha, as well as with Mary. Jesus continues to reveal himself not only as the good, the great, or the chief shepherd, but as the resurrection and the life. Let me read the first four verses of chapter 11 from John's Gospel. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And so you, you get this story, right? And, and from a human perspective, again, we're, we're baffled at uh, what's going on. Certainly the disciples were baffled at what was going on, uh, you know, because Jesus decided to stay two more days. And, uh, and so in verse 4, uh, the question is, the sickness is on, not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through its significance, uh, through it. Then the significance is what? I mean, what, what's, what does that verse speak to you about? We have uh, mics out here, Tim. So it says to me, or it speaks to me, because uh, Christ also says that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Mm -hmm and to also let everyone know that he is the true Son of God, and that only through the power of God, through Jesus Christ, can these miracles happen. And that's, uh, that's what that's uh, telling me. Yeah. Uh, Justin, turn to 2 Corinthians 12 for a minute. Read for us verses seven to ten. If you remember, this is this is the incident where where Paul's talking about his thorn in the flesh, right? And he was, you know, he he, he asked, right? 
uh, three times that the Lord would take away the pain. We would take away the uh, annoyance of whatever this thorn was. Many believe it was uh, his eyesight was, was gone. Um, but regardless, uh, notice uh, what Paul says in, uh, in verses 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Yes. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that I might leave, that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is, is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, what, a, what a profound reaction uh, to the answer that he was given um, about this thorn that he had, right? Uh, uh, why did he get the thorn? Does anybody know? Because he was, he was given the privilege of, of looking into the third heavens and, and, uh, and seeing things that he says, I can't even talk about these things, you know. I can't describe them for you. I was told I can't talk about them. And, uh, and, and so he's, he's been given this marvelous privilege of, of seeing something that no one else has seen except the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and so uh, to keep him from getting puffed up, you know, let's face it. Paul was a great apostle. He was a super apostle. Uh, but he was a human. And, and, and you know, when you, you have that tendency to go, well, yeah, you haven't seen what I've seen, right? That would be the first human instinct you would have when somebody starts to challenge you. But no, he's been given a thorn to humble him. And so, and so how do these verses fit into what Jesus says in, in John chapter 11? Hey, Brother Dennis, can you hear me? This is Steve. I'm sitting downstairs. <laughs> God, you told me. I'm looking for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, what Justin just read, I have to say, you know, I experienced that in my own personal life right after I gave my life um, back to the Lord. Um, it, it was within probably weeks or months that I was um, afflicted with my uh, ulcerative colitis that eventually led to serious surgeries and all that. And during that time, I kept praying, asking that same thing that Paul prayed. And I kept, you know, reading that scripture. And I wasn't going to, you know, take no for an answer unless I, you know, heard from the Spirit. And I felt the Spirit speak to me the same thing, saying, my grace is sufficient for you. And in, in your weakness, you know, I will be made strong. And it was from that point on that I truly embraced what I was going through instead of trying to fight it and let the Lord lead me. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Steve. Yeah, uh, I, I think a lot, what I want you to understand is, right, in every situation, every situation in our lives is an opportunity to glorify God. Every situation, every situation, even the bad things that are, yes, even the bad, especially the bad things that are happening, you know. Uh, can you imagine what this raising of Lazarus did for the faith of Mary and Martha in particular? But we know there were lots of other people there that saw it, right? And they were giddy as all, everything when, when they left there. And they were the same people who, who went when he went to go into Jerusalem on that last week. They were saying, you know, Hosanna to the highest, right? Uh, glory to God. And four days later, they were chanting for him to be crucified. Um, look at two verses with me. Somebody find Genesis 50, and somebody find Romans 8. I mean, if you've never got this lesson, 
from the Bible, then you've really been missing something. Uh, somebody read uh, from Genesis chapter 50, uh, verse 20. I have verse 20, Genesis 50. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Mm. Yeah. What's the context of the verse that we just read? Anybody? It's Joseph. <laughs> right? This is about Joseph. And Joseph is saying... You know, you, you threw me in a pit. You, you, you know, you, you, you want, one of you wanted to kill me uh, and everything else. And, and then, you know, he, we know his life. He goes through. He goes into prison. He gets out, you know, he gets thrown into prison because he's accused of something that he didn't do, right? And, and, and he's wondering, you know, and he's sitting there. And from our perspective, we would have said, what is going on? You know, what did I ever do to you, Lord? But there was an... You know, we talk about the big picture sometimes. And, and we can see sometimes in our life certain things now that we look back and we see the breadcrumbs, really. And, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I see why I went, I see why this, I see why this happened. The same thing with Joseph. He's going all the way through, and then finally he gets to interpret, right, the dreams. And because he does, he's made second in, in command in the land of Egypt. And, and his brothers come. And they don't know it's Joseph. They think Joseph's dead. And finally he reveals himself to them. And he says, I know you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Why? Because I'm going to save the remnant of Israel, this family, who's going to become right, and, and so, and so Jacob and his sons, Jacob's name was changed to what? Israel. Israel, and his twelve sons became the twelve tribes of Israel. They would never survive because of the famine that went on. And yet, God took something bad and made it work for good. He can do the same thing in my life and yours. In, in Romans 8, 28. Hmm? Yep. Yeah. Romans 8, 28. <clears throat> we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. <coughs> Yeah. That's a promise to you and to me. Because of our love for God, all things work together for good. Are all things great? No. There's not one of you sitting here can say, my life has just been one great episode after another. Yes, sir? <laughs> I don't want to speak for you. But, right? I mean, we've all had incidences in our life uh, <clears throat> that we wondered where the bottom was and when we found the bottom all we could do was look up and, 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 and God says you know what all things work together yes even the lows even the bad times work together for your good because you love God and he loves you and he's got a plan and a purpose for our lives anyone else? I would, just make, I would just make the comment, Dennis, it says, we know, okay? We don't guess. Mm -hmm. We don't, well, we read that this is supposed to work the good. We need to know that we know. This is, well, as you said, this is God's promise to us, and we don't have to see how it's going to work, work the good. That probably won't be, much of it won't be revealed till, till later. But the thing that we need to know is that we know. Yeah. 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 You know, just like Steve's circumstances that he was talking about. He, yeah, that was a low, low for him. And yet, things worked out and came together uh, to where he is today. Same with you and I and the experiences we go through. Dennis? Yep. Not, not only do we know, but 
you know, the sisters send a message to him that Lazarus was, was sick. Jesus didn't say, oh, really? He's, he knew. He knew. This illness does not lead to death, but it's for the God's glory. He knew that there was a special purpose, mm -hmm. a higher purpose for Lazarus' sickness and death. That's right. He knew. Yeah. So even before we wake up and realize things are going on, he already knows. It's a wonderful thing to know he knows <laughs> what we're going through. Yeah, it's funny. You, you know, you never catch God, you never catch Jesus going, really? <laughs> I never knew, what? I didn't know that. Not once do you catch them off guard, you know. They knew. They knew all things. They knew the end from the beginning. That's what we're told about, about our Lord. Um, okay, verses 5 to 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed then two days longer in the place where he was. <clears throat> okay, again, from the human perspective, uh, the disciples had to be wondering, uh, hello, he's dying, he's sick. Right? If Jesus really loved Martha, the question says, in Mary and Lazarus, why did he stay for two more days? Why did he stay? He stayed because he knows the, knows the plans of God. He knows that this is, this is going, going to be a magnificent thing, but one of the requirements is, is, is Lazarus is going to pass. And his, his uh, disciples that are with him are probably thinking, ah, it's not, he's not that sick. Yeah. You know, Martha and Mary, are, you know, they're just getting, uh, rah, was, women are getting carried away, you know, type of, type of. Yeah. He would have gone if he was really sick. Oh, yeah, yeah. if he was really sick, he'd no. be there. Yeah. Uh, Cindy? Well, there was a purpose to all that because, yes, he loved Martha and her sister. However, he also knew what was going to happen to Lazarus. And he had to let it happen in order to prove what he could do and how he could rectify it because. Nobody else can do that. And he wanted to prove that he is who he is and you need to believe in him and the miracles he can perform by raising Lazarus after he had been dead for several days. And if he had, if he had gone immediately, that could not have happened. That's right. So he had to wait. Amen. Very good. Right. Uh, you know, I've told you this a number of times. Your day is a number. <laughs> no. Let me rephrase that. Boy, we've all got a certain number of days. That's what scripture tells us. We don't know what that last day is, right? Uh, who knows, right? how's the song go? I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand, right? Uh, we don't know, but God knows. And so, our purpose while we have life and breath is to serve and honor God in any way we can. All right? I, let me share with you just a couple of insights. You know, within the spiritual time clock, okay, not, not the physical time, you should have some important truths. First of all, God is never late. Okay? Never. And and uh, Bill Appleton's famous line was? He's coming and he won't be a minute late. He won't be a minute late. Jesus won't be a minute late. Everybody said, where is this coming? He won't be one minute late. He'll be here. All right? His watch is calculated to eternal matters, not temporal consequences. Okay? You and I see the temporal. We need to have eyes that see the eternal. Right? The disciples couldn't see it. You and I have been given the spirit to understand what happens at the end. 
You know, the glories of closing the book of Revelation is that God wins. <laughs> God wins, and, and the earth is restored to what it was supposed to have been in the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden. Okay, and then there's, it's important that there are two perspectives. Right? This is our, th our human perspective. That when we look at life, we focus on the urgent, and sometimes we blur the important. Okay? We, we focus on the urgent, uh, you know, Lord, I need you now. You know, Lord, I need you now. Ever pray one of those prayers? Lord, I really need you now. Right? And sometimes it blurs the more important things that are going on. It concentrates on the immediate rather than the ultimate welfare that we have. Our temporary good instead of God's eternal glory. That's the way we need to think about life and the experiences we go through. How does this ultimately bring glory to God? That's how you should think. Not necessarily, you know, um, it's all about me, you see. Well, to tell you the truth, no, it isn't all about you. And the second is the divine perspective. Factors eternity into the puzzling equations of life, right? Think eternal. The, the divine, I should say, the divine says, not my will, but thine be done. You ever hear those words before? Yeah. Even though Jesus knew the plans and purposes, he knew why he was here on this earth. And yet, when it came to the time of the Gethsemane, right? He was he was just he was praying, but he says, "Lord, if there's another way," because he knew what he was going to go through. He knew it. He says, "But not my will, but thine be done." And ultimately, he gathered the strength to carry through. And praise the Lord, he did. Mm. Any other comments? Five through six? Okay. Um, somebody read verses seven to eleven for us of John chapter eleven. Luke? Then he said, then he said to his, oh. Starting at seven. Yeah. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world the light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you going back why are you going back there, Lord? Uh, you know they tried to throw you the last time you were there, because you had a work to do. And you can't be afraid to do the Lord's work. You can't, you can't, you can't be intimidated by that which is evil. But interestingly, he says, our friend Lazarus is asleep. But I go that I may wake him up. And the question is, why is death referred to as a sleep? When a person sleeps in death, is he or she really dead? Or are they, yeah, comment here, just in suspended animation? Sure. Not someplace else? They are dead. They are dead. D E A D, absence of life. Hmm. Somebody turn to Genesis chapter 2 for a minute. And read 
read for us 15 to 17. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. You shall die. That would be D I E. <laughs> die. <clears throat> right? Or literally in the Hebrew, it's in dying you will die. Okay? I mean, he didn't die the minute he ate of that fruit. Right? But the process of dying began in him. The penalty of sin is death, we're told. Um, Romans 5. Romans 5, uh, verse 12. Justin. Therefore, just as though one man, sin, entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay. The penalty of sin is death. And since all men have sinned, all men die. They don't continue living on. Do you get it? D E A D means dead. Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the free God, gift of God is eternal life in Christ. God has a plan and a purpose for mankind. You see, because since the day of Adam, man has been born, he lives, and he dies. And he goes into the ground. He doesn't go anywhere else. The dead know nothing, says Ecclesiastes. Why? What, what happens if, if, if that cycle continues and nobody breaks it? Down through history. How many centuries have been? We don't, we don't know uh, when, when Adam was, right? But five, six thousand years worth of human history. Man has been born, man lives, man dies. Why is the resurrection so important? Because if, if there was no resurrection, the cycle would continue and continue and continue until, until man ultimately destroys himself. But, you know, there's one three-letter word that uh, the Bible gives us. But, Jesus died and was raised from the dead. And now there's a hope for the rest of mankind. He's the first to be raised. And he says there will be first fruits. Who are those? That will be the church. Right? God is calling the church in this age. And they'll be the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. And then the world of mankind will come forth. That's what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 5. We'll read it in, in a few minutes. Right? But uh, there's going to be a resurrection of the church and a resurrection of mankind. Because if there wasn't, they would all live eternally in the grave. Where there is no work done. Where there is no thought. 
there is no life. Hmm. Um, let's see, we got uh, Matthew chapter 9 there. Somebody want to find that? And then somebody find Acts 7? Brother, Brother Dennis, this is uh, Steve. Yeah. Um, while they're looking for that, can I just make a quick comment? Yes, please. Um, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, Solomon said, In my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. For whatever happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all return the dust. And that's where we would remain if it wasn't for Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Uh, someone have 18 and 19 of Matthew chapter 9? Justin? Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. Right. What you're seeing in, in the resurrection of Lazarus, is a picture of what is going to happen to mankind in the next age. Lazarus was raised, we know in the story. He was raised. Did uh, Lazarus live forever? No, he died again, didn't he? Right? But it was a picture to us of what's going to happen when every person on this earth is raised. To live for the Lord. To live in the presence of God. To, to, to be rehabilitated to what God wants us to be. The church is privileged now because the church is trying to live as Jesus lived. And there are members all around the world, right? And they're all striving to become like Jesus. You and I are trying to become like Jesus. And one day he's going to come back and he's going to take a bride for himself. You have the opportunity to be a part of that bride. John says, we will see him as he is and we shall be like him when we are resurrected. Uh, one more, uh, 23 to 26. Uh, right there, you still got the, uh, read first uh, verses 23 to 26. 23 to 26, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Mm, chapter 9. Matthew, what you read before. Sorry about that. It's okay. <clears throat> and what was the... 23, chapter 9, 23 to 26. 23 to 26. When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all the land. Yeah, yeah. In, in the uh, series, The Chosen, uh, they have this scene, and it's a, it's a great scene if you ever have a chance to, to watch it. It's one of those scenes that, uh, you know, that she hasn't died, she's just asleep, right? They know she died. And, uh, and, and this, they've gone to the point where uh, 
you hire, back then you hired professional mourners, and they would come and they'd play their flutes of mourning, and, and uh, people would go through their shenanigans of, of uh, being in grief for the family. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus comes on and says, she, she hasn't died, she's just asleep. And they all start laughing at him. And so he kicks them all out of the house and says, all right, everybody leave except for the parents and the three disciples. Three disciples always get the uh, privilege, right? Uh, who are the three disciples that always get to go? James, John, John, James. John, James, and Peter, right? They get to see all those special events. Brings them up to there and uh, takes her by the hand and raises her. And, uh, and can you imagine, you know, that, that was the part of the scene I liked in, in The Chosen, was when they bring her down. <laughs> They bring her down, and the ones who would laugh. Uh, what do you say? I mean, you know, what, do you, what can you say? You can't, you can't call him a charlatan. You can't say anything, you know, except be embarrassed uh, that uh, you don't know everything. Yeah, that was a wonderful scene. Uh, another one, Acts chapter seven. Anybody have that? Rich, 59 to 60. <clears throat> While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, mm -hmm. and Saul approved the killing of him. Yeah, in, in the American Standard, uh, it says he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Right? That is how God views death. As a sleep. What, what is it about a sleep that, that is interesting to you and I? You wake up. <laughs> uh, the, the, the expectation is, of course, we're going to wake up. Right? And, and what do we remember? For those of us who don't toss and turn in our sleep. What do we remember when we close our eyes and then wake up? Nothing. Nothing. Unless you got things on your mind and that's all you think about all night, right? right. That, that's what that is pictured as. Asleep. We close our eyes in death. And the next instance we will know is hearing that trumpet, that voice of the archangel. And then the dead in Christ will rise. And those who are alive in Christ come up together and meet him in the air. Right? That's his second appearing. You know, his advent is that his second advent, I believe, is after that, when he, when he returns with the church to the earth. That's that's how scripture views death. Alright? Yes, we're gonna die. If the Lord doesn't return while we're breathing, we are going to die. And the minute we close our eyes, the next thing we will know, it'll be like it was nothing. That's what, that's what a good night's sleep will give you. A good night's sleep will give you. That is, you close your eyes, and the next thing you know, you're awake, and, and, you, uh, and you're ready for a new day. We're going to be not only ready for a new day, we're going to be ready for a new, new age. A new body. A new body. Isn't that incredible? No? Yeah. We shall be like him. He, what did he have? Glory, honor, and immortality. The church is going to have glory, honor, and immortality. We will be like him. Remember, he, 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 he was here one instance after he was resurrected, and then he was here. He was, you know, it was no time frame. He was on the way, uh, the road to uh, Emmaus. And then he disappeared, and next thing, the next scene is he's walking through a locked door, coming through a locked door, and then see the disciples. And they thought they saw a ghost. Yeah, of course they did. Yeah, and some guy walking through the door, right? Uh, there was no limitations on, on the immortal body, and there'll be no limitations for us. I believe the time space continuum disappears from our human perspective. It's going to be incredible. We could let our minds wander forever on that. Um, 
And in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 51. I have that, Brother Dennis. Yep. Be, um, do you want me to read just 51 or 52 too? Sure. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Amen. Amen. Again, re-emphasis over and over again. Death is asleep. And, and when Jesus says that I may wake him up, right? I, I kind of quoted it, but I didn't uh, give it to you fully. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Right? We read this all the time uh, when we have a funeral service. Right? You know, the Thessalonians were concerned. You know, well, what's going to happen uh, to all, you know, my, my brother and my sister who passed away already? What's going to happen to them? Paul, tell me. And he says, well, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. Get it? Those who are asleep. They're nowhere else. They're in the ground. That you may not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's a key phrase. Do you believe that? Yes. That should have been amen, right? We, amen. Jesus died and rose again, right? Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ. You know, when I think about that, I think about the story of Jericho. Remember the story of Jericho? They did, you know, they fought a very unusual warfare for them, right? And God said, you know, I'm going to give you the city. Uh, I said, all right, so they're all, they got their spears and their, their swords all ready. He goes, no, nope, none of that. He says, I want you to walk around the city once a day for six days. Mark, uh, the fighting men, right? Go around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, I want you to go around. How often does the number seven appear in scripture? Seven means completeness, right? Perf perfection. Go around the city seven times. And at, don't say a word. Nobody's talking. I don't want anybody to talk. Go around seven times. And then when I give the signal, what did he want him to do? Shout. And blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet and shout. And victory was theirs. You know, I mean, that's a song we should end with. Victory in Jesus. Huh? I think that's where we'll go. 82. It was victory. That's what it's going to be when Jesus shouts and the archangel shouts, right? It's going to be victory. Because it's going to be a victory over that grave that has haunted mankind for centuries. Now, we're uh, not making a lot of progress here. Um, uh, verses 12 to 16. Chapter 11 of John. I'm going to read it just to save us time. The disciples therefore said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death. But they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So you got the, the euphemism for sleep is death. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes I was not there, that you may believe, but let us go to him. You know, so it's a purpose. It's gonna it's gonna re-energize their faith. You know, they're gonna see something spectacular coming up. All right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what are the implications if Jesus had gone? Do you think he would have sat around in the house two days while Lazarus <laughs> was dying and not helping? Of course. You know, it, it's all part of the plan. 17 says, And when Jesus came, he found he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, where many of the Jews had come, 
Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet, meet him. But Mary still sat in the house. And Martha said, therefore, to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. All right, and so the question on the sheet is, what's the implications of Martha's statement to Jesus? Martha had seen Martha had seen Jesus perform many miracles, many sick, sick, sick people. <clears throat> he had them all. So she, although, well, actually he had raised some others, but she, she knew that, that, that God would do, give Jesus what he wanted. So she understood that he, he, uh, um, he, he had the power. He had the power. He had God's power if he asked for it to raise to raise to raise Lazarus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she had a strong faith. She had a stronger faith than all the religious leaders at that time, right? They 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 did refuse to want to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Never mind the Son of God. Uh, uh, but you know, truth be told, as strong as that statement was of her faith. Um, Jesus had already demonstrated that he didn't even need to be there to heal someone. Remember that? The, the, the centurion's servant? You know? And why did he marvel at the, the centurion in, in, in his faith? Because the centurion says, you, you know, you don't have to come to my house. He says, I know if you just give the, you just give the order. I'm, you know, I'm a soldier too. He says, uh, and, uh, if you just give the order, uh, it'll happen. And Jesus was like, Four, we would say in our vernacular. He goes, I've never seen a faith like that in Israel. And he says, go your way. Your servant is healed. And the servant was healed. And, and so truth be told, Martha, that what you're saying is absolutely true. But Jesus could have healed him four days ago, right where he was sitting while he was waiting to come. Um, Twenty-three and twenty-four said, "You know, even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give to you." And Jesus said, "Your brother shall rise again. Shall rise." He didn't say, "Yeah, he's risen. He's risen. He's in heaven." That's not what he says. Your brother shall rise again. And Martha said to him, "I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day." What's she talking about? What's he talking about there? Talking about, talking about the resurrection. The marvels of Martha, Martha was that she had listened, right? You know, we always have that story of Martha was busy in the kitchen and Mary was the one that was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, uh, and it's kind of implied, but it's not true, that uh, Mary was soaking it up and Martha was like letting it go and she was more worried about feeding him. Martha had an incredible understanding of Scripture, of the plans and purposes of God. She goes, I, you know, I know he's going to be raised again in the resurrection on the last day. Uh, that's true, Martha. But guess what? I am the resurrection and the life. Do we have to wait till the last day, Martha? Is where he's leading them. We don't have to wait till the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. And everyone who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. Okay, he's talking about the future resurrection. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe? Everyone who, in the next age who continues to believe will have life everlasting. 
not immortality, life everlasting on this earth. And she said, yes, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who even comes into the world. Hey, she got it right. The scribes and the Pharisees couldn't grasp it. The disciples couldn't grasp it until Peter did that marvelous confession, right? When Jesus says, who do men say that I am? You know, they were saying all sorts of names, you know, you're this, you're that. Uh, you're somebody who, you know, Elijah has come back from the dead. And he, and he says, yeah, I know, but who do you say I am? And Peter guided by the power of the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, again, marvels. He says, you know, no man told you that. My Father in Heaven told you that. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. Blessed are you, Peter. And upon that statement, I will build my church, he says. Okay. Um... Any other questions or thoughts through 27? Because I don't want to miss the, the big, uh, the best part of the story. Uh, Brother Dennis. Yes, uh, go ahead. I have, a, I have a comment. I mean, everything from 20 all the way down to 23, that's our human nature. There's times where we have the faith, we live in the Lord, and in the spirit and we trust him and we know that you know there's the you know the next age coming but how many times when we are praying for someone or how many times when we know there's a family member that's sick do we quickly go the opposite direction going lord i know you can heal them and then we're like oh well they died well we know that you know almost like a sad well we know they're in the grave now and they'll be raised at the last day it shouldn't be that sadness. You know, I mean, that's such a human statement right there. We should hold on to the every day, no matter what tragedies come, we need to hold on to that, those of us who know, to, to be joyous in the fashion of whatever the Lord wills. You know, we know that we have, you know, eternal life, you know, coming. And we know in this age we are going to have to die. And we just pray that we carry ourselves right to where we don't have that momentary um, kind of doubt and then all of a sudden be like, oh, that's right, I, I shouldn't have felt that way. Even though it's normal and, it, and it's human, we should get to the point where that doesn't happen. We are constantly in the spirit. We are looking forward to the next stage. We're being that encouragement to our brothers and sisters and even those who do not believe that are around us. But that doesn't mean we won't be sad, right? So th this is the good news, the gospel message, the joy of Christmas. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, A-L-L, all people. For there is born to you this day, there is born to you all, all you people, this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's what the joy of Christmas is. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so we, we have the story. Martha's come to him, and Martha goes back to the house and, and says, tells Mary, right? Mary uh, loves him, and, and, and she comes running and says basically the same question. You know, if you've been here, and... Uh, and, and you know, Jesus didn't do an eye roll, but he might have, you know, if he heard it enough times. And, you know, if you'd only been here, you know, they wouldn't have, you know, even the, even the people that were hanging around says, you know, if he had been here, he, he wouldn't have died. Um, she fell at his feet and says, you know, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Why was he troubled? You know, I got the verse 33, I've got the four different uh, translations. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He, said, he sighed heavily and was deeply moved. He was deeply moved and visibly distressed. One version says, a deep anger welled up within him. And he 
is deeply troubled. Why? Why are we to be so upset with the people weeping over the death of a man that a lot of them love? I, I suggest to you, you know, Lazarus was a close friend. There, you know, it, it's not, there's nothing wrong with, with crying over the death of a loved one. Not at all. But it should never affect your, your, your notion of what the eternal brings. But I think a deeper thing that he was, I think, was angry or was emotionally involved was because that's not the way God intended it to be. Right? When Adam and Eve were put on the garden, in the Garden of Eden, it was that they were to commune with God and, and the garden would grow, they would, have, they, would, they would multiply and go forth, right? And, and the earth would be one big paradise. And death never would enter the, the equation. That's the way it was supposed to have been. And guess what? At the end of the age, that's what it's going to be. Paradise lost, paradise regained. But Jesus is, is angry because this is not what God had intended. The suffering and the pain of the fall of the Garden of Eden. It is point of the man wants to die. And then the judgment. That's not the way it was originally intended. And so I think that's why he was groaning. He, he was angry because the adversary had won that battle. The God wins the war. Remember that. Okay, and the last one. Um, Jesus says, remove the stone. Martha, the, si the sister of the deceased, again, uh, gets her shaky uh, theology there. She goes, you know, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. She's been dead four days, you know. Yes, we know. <laughs> we know. And, and we know that uh, the body starts decaying right after three days. Uh, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? He has to remind her. Did I tell you, you, you know, you're going to see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou heardest me, and I knew that thou heardest me always. But because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didn't send me. Well, what's interesting about the prayer that Jesus prayed? Unusual. What, 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 what unusual in the prayer that he prayed? It's a neat Well, I think it was obvious that everybody did not believe he could do that. And they didn't believe he is, was, was Christ. They didn't believe he was the Son of God. They didn't believe any of those things. And only by doing this, in the manner he did do it, and in the time way he did it by letting uh, Lazarus die, and then move in the stone, and after days, and bring him out alive, it proved who he was. There was no longer, or should be no longer, any doubt. No question as to who he was. Yeah, yeah. He had to say it, uh, you know, he was going to have a lot of people watching this very moment. Uh, one of the things that struck me was, uh, you know, when we pray, what, what do we do? Go to solitude. Yeah, what do we actually do in prayer? We did it this morning. Close our eyes. <laughs> we bowed our heads and closed our eyes. What did Jesus do when he prayed? He looked up. He looked up. Father, I knowest thou hear me. Right? Uh, and you, and you, you always hear me. Uh, but because of the people around me, he's, he's praying. So, you know, we always get these um, stereotypes of when we pray, it's always with our heads bowed or on our knees, uh, um, sitting in our chairs with our eyes closed. Right? It can be, it can be, and it can, you know, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't make you any more spiritual if you close your eyes or you open your eyes while the prayer is being said. Okay. Well, Brother Dennis. Yep, go ahead. I like when uh, 
when it says after he lifted up his eyes, he says, Father, because I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That's pretense. You know, he has heard him. Jesus has already been in discussion with the Father asking, asking for this to be done and for him to say it. You know, I thank you that you have heard me. He didn't say, I thank you that you're going to hear me or that you, you know, that you're going to answer what I'm about to ask. Yeah. He's saying that you have heard me. Yeah. And I believe when we go before the Lord in prayer, he has already heard our prayers before we have prayed them. It doesn't mean we don't pray. Oh, well, if he already knows what I'm going to pray, then there's no need to. Well, no, no, that's just a foolish statement. But to know that he hears us and he knows our groanings in our own hearts, even before we bring it before him. Amen. That is true. That is absolutely true. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt for a minute that while they were walking for two days or whatever it was uh, that it took to, to get there, that Jesus wasn't in communion with his father, praying about what was going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, you know, Lazarus comes out after four days being dead. Comes out bound. That should be a hallelujah moment, right? That he came through. You know, and I'm sure there was a lot of uh, uh, hearts that stopped for a minute. <laughs> When they saw, you know, come, you know, yeah, I mean, he had to probably come out hopping because he was all bound, he was all bound up in, uh, in his linens and everything else, and he comes out hopping, and you know, they say, "I'm bind, you know, I'm bind him," and, uh, you know, and, and you know, that's not the last you hear of Lazarus. Uh, he, he uh, Jesus is staying with him, and, and the, that's when the Pharisees and scribes said, "All right, we got to kill this guy after this story." We gotta kill this guy because everybody's gonna believe in it. And and it says, and we gotta kill Lazarus too, because he's hanging around and everybody sees him and they know he was dead. I'm sure Lazarus the priest appreciated hearing that. I'm gonna kill you too, you know. Great. Thanks for bringing me back. Yeah. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, I was gonna say uh, about his about that prayer. I'm sorry I'm a little delayed here. But um, because of the people who are who are standing by, I said this. Again, they're going to see the glory of God. All right, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus' glory is that God sent him and works through him. It's God's glory. Yeah, everything done that Jesus did was to ultimately to the glory of the Father. And, and so we're told in Scripture, uh, when we honor Jesus, we are also honoring the Father. You know, so every time we give honor and glory to Jesus, we're giving honor and glory to the Father. That's the way it works. No man can come on to the Father but by me, said Jesus. So everything we do is through Jesus to the Father. It's a beautiful story. I am the resurrection and life. Yes. Uh, it's a story that is going to be uh, played out here in this age. It's going to come to an end. And uh, you should be excited just a little bit. I, I can see you're all uh, still thinking about thir Thursday's uh, meal. But listen, uh, this is something to really get excited about. Praise the Lord. Any closing comments? Okay, Justin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brother Dennis. For that wonderful, wonderful sermon. And let us all rise, and we will sing together. And 82, Victory in Jesus. And let's sing all verses.
we thank you again for this time which has been ours. We thank you for the victory we have in our Lord Jesus, our, our Savior forever. And uh, Father, we thank you for each head bowed here. We thank you for your, your mercies and love for us. We thank you for your power of your spirit that moves mightily in the hearts of those uh, who truly love you. And, and so bless the brotherhood around the world as they gather together, Father, on this day, uh, wherever they may be. May your, your grace and mercies be upon them as we anxiously await that day when your Son shall return. For that, Father, we uh, give you glory and honor for the plans and purposes you have established in and through our Lord Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the captain of our salvation. And um, to that end, Father, uh, we thank you and praise you. Uh, prayed for Cindy and, uh, and our sister Cindy and Jean, Father, and ask for you to continue Heal and touch upon them. It's good to see Cindy in our midst. And so, uh, Father, uh, thank you for that answered prayer. And uh, as we get ready to go to our respective homes, Father, dismiss us with your grace and peace. Uh, as we walk in the valley, Father, until we meet again at the feet of Jesus, uh, may we give you honor and glory and praise in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.